One of the Buddha's insights is that truths don't just represent the way things are. In other words, they're not just an act of reporting, but they also have a power. Certain truths will make you do things. Allow you to look at things in a certain way that allow you, that will then allow you to act or f impel you to act. This is one of the reasons why the noble truths are noble, because they get you to act in a noble way. The Buddha wasn't interested in saying simply things that were true, as you remember his comment on the things he would say, they'd be true and beneficial and timely. And the beneficial part had to do with not only the, the meaning of the words, but also what they would get you to do. This is one of the reasons why the two words, Dhamma and Atta, A-T-T-H-A, go together so often in the canon. Atta is the meaning of the words, but also means to goal. What is this truth for? Where does it head? Where does it lead? It's because truths have power, that they do lead in a certain direction. Because there are lots of true things you could say. And sometimes the truths would actually be contradictory, at least they would sound contradictory. There are ways you can look at the aggregates and say that they're stressful, and others other cases, as the Buddha admitted, there are there is pleasure in the aggregates. You can't say it's one hundred percent stress. But then the question is, which truth are you going to focus on? What's the result going to be? What is it going to get you to do? And if you focus on how pleasant the aggregates are, you're going to hold on to them. If you focus on their stressful side, then you're going to do what you can not to be trapped by them. Now, the noble truths are truths noble not only because they get you to do noble things, but they get you to a noble attainment. The Buddha talked about two kinds of searches in life. There's the search for happiness and things that will change. And he says there's nothing noble about that. And then there's a the search for happiness and things that don't change. No aging, no illness, no death. And he says that kind of search is noble. And so we look at things in terms of the Four Noble Truths. There are certain duties that go along with them, and we fulfill those duties. They'll take us to something deathless, and that experience of the deathless is what guarantees that they really are true, and they really are noble. And we can look at the truths and think about them and decide that, yes, they seem reasonable. But as the Buddha said, just because something is reasonable doesn't mean that it really is true. The fact that they're reasonable is something that gives us confidence or conviction in the truth. That's one of his observations that goes against a lot of what we think about in the West. That conviction or things like faith are opposed to reason. Now that's because there's a major religion here in our society that talks about things that you have to take on faith, even though they go contrary to reason. So we think that reason and faith are two radically different things. But as the Buddha said, just because the Four Noble Truths seem reasonable doesn't necessarily mean that they're true. There's a further test. But their reasonableness is what gives you the faith and conviction that they're worth the test. If something doesn't make sense, if it contradicts itself, it doesn't really invite you to test whether it's true. But if something seems reasonable, it seems worthy of the test. So you put it to the test, and you put yourself to the test, too, because these truths demand a lot of you. They demand that you look at your thoughts and your words and your deeds, and particularly your thoughts. In a way that many
many times you will have to let go of the ones that you really like. It's because you learn how to look at the thoughts as part of a causal process. When you think in this particular way, where does it lead? This is what's special about the Noble Truths, is that they focus on this process of what the mind is doing with the truth. They contain the seeds for their own transcendence in this way. There's a passage where Anatta Bindig is talking to a group of, a group of wanderers. He wanted to see the Buddha. It was too early in the morning. The Buddha and the, the monks were out on their alms around. So he talked to some wanderers and he asked them what their views were. Well, they come and see him first. Excuse me. He comes to see them. And they ask him first, what does the Buddha believe? What are his views? And it's interesting. Here's Ananda Bendiga, who was a stream banner by that time. He's already seen the deathless. He says, I really don't know the full extent of the Buddha's views. Remembering, of course, that what the Buddha taught was just that handful of leaves as opposed to the leaves in the forest, which were the various types of knowledge he got in his awakening. And so they said, well, in that case, what do you believe? What, is, what are your views? And he said, I'll be happy to tell, my, tell you my views, but first you tell me yours. And so the different groups have their different positions. Some say that the world is eternal. Some say that it's not eternal. Some say it's finite, infinite. The body is the same thing as the soul. The body is different from the soul. After the death of a Tathagata, you can say either that he exists or he doesn't exist, or both or neither. And as Nandabendika points out, that particular view is stressful. It's in constant, it's put together, and everything that's in constant put together is going to lead to stress if you hold on to it. And as you cling to it, you cling to stress. And so they say, okay, what's your view? And they said, well, whatever is inconstant and put together is stressful. And they said, well, you're holding to that. You're clinging to that. You're going to suffer from that, too. And he says, no. Holding this view, I, I see the escape from it. In other words, because it focuses you back on the process of how you relate to truths and how you relate to your views, it enables you to let go. And in the letting go, that's when it leads to the deathless. So these are special views, and they're special because of their power. They lead you to a certain kind of action. They lead you to look at your own mind carefully. What are you doing? How do you relate to your thoughts and words and deeds? How do you relate to your beliefs? How do you relate to your practices? all the things that we tend to cling to. How can you learn how not to cling to them? We need certain views and we need certain habits and practices and even certain assumptions about ourselves in order to practice. But how to use these things so that they don't just keep you trapped? When they've done the work, how can you learn to let go? Well, in the beginning you learn, as the Buddha said, not to pride yourself over your views or your habits, and you don't brag about them, and you don't get into needless arguments with people about them. Because when you get into arguments, then there's a question of who wins the arguments, and that leads to a certain amount of pride, and that pride will be a cause of a problem. So that's how you begin to use these parts of the practice without being tied down to them and without using them to create more trouble for yourself. Remember that image of the, the snake. As the Buddha said, you try to grasp a snake, and if you grasp it wrongly, in other words, you grasp it by the tail, it's going to bite you. If you grasp it rightly, then it's not going to cause any trouble. You take a stick and you, a forked stick, and you pin it down right behind its head. And no matter how much it may writhe around the stick or even around your arm, it can't do you any harm. Now notice in both cases you're holding the snake, but in one case you hold it in a way that it doesn't cause you any harm. The views are things you do have to hold to, but you have to learn how to hold to them properly. You hold to these truths in a proper way, because they lead you to something beyond them, if you hold them properly. 
Some people would say, well, you just don't have any views at all. Well, that would be like not holding the snake at all. And if you don't hold the snake, how are you going to get the advantage you can get out of snakes? And you can get their venom, and you can use the venom to create, to create anti-venom. There are lots of uses for, for the snake venom. If you don't hold on to the snake at all, you're never going to get it. So you do have to hold on. But it's a question of how you hold on. You remember you're holding on for the purpose of getting past suffering. That's what the Four Noble Truths all keep pointing to. Simply laying things out. There's suffering, and there's this cause, and there's a cessation of suffering, and there's a path to its cessation. Well, the cessation is obviously where you want to go. The truths give you a goal. They give you an atta, a purpose. And they get you to act toward that purpose. That's the power of these truths. And then they reveal their power. Well, the sense of being true and noble, when they lead to a real experience of the deathless. And when that comes, you naturally put them aside, because you realize that talking about the deathless is, not, is one thing, but actually experiencing is something else. And it's experience you're going for. So when you consider the various truths in the world, you'll notice that some have a lot of power, some have very little power. Certain facts you can learn and they don't have any impact on your behavior at all. Those are things that are true but not necessarily beneficial. There are certain truths that if you act on them are going to actually cause trouble. Those are not truths you want to get involved with either. It's ones that are true and beneficial and right for you at this time. And the Noble Truths, as the Buddha said, are categorically true. In other words, they're always true. They always apply to every situation. So learn how to apply them in the right way, so that they can really reveal their power, the power that makes them noble.